But what does super hard mean? Uh, well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, uh, in, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a, a small office and we slept on the couch. Uh, and we, we showered at the, the YMCA. And uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had just one computer. So the, 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 the website was up during the day uh, and I was coding at night. Seven days a week, all the time. Um, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period. And in order to be with me, she had to sleep in the office. So uh, work hard, like in, in, I mean, every waking hour. That's that's the, the thing I would I would say. If, if you particularly if you're starting a company, um, and I mean, if you do simple math, say like, okay, if somebody else is working 50 hours and you're working 100. Uh, you'll get twice as done as much done in the course of a year. I think certainly uh, being focused on something that you're confident will have high value to someone else um, and just being really rigorous in making that assessment um, because people are, tend, tend to, a natural human tendency is wishful thinking. Um, so a, a challenge for entrepreneurs is to say, well, what's the difference between really believing in your ideals and sticking, sticking to them versus pursuing some unrealistic dream that right. doesn't actually have merit. And it's, it's, that, is a, it, that is a really difficult thing to, to tell you. Can you tell the difference between those two things? Right. You know? So you need to be sort of very rigorous um, in, in your self-analysis. Uh, self um, I think certainly extremely tenacious uh, and, um, and then just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in you know, 80 hour, 80 to 100 hour weeks every week. And then that, that, that all those things improve the odds of success. Okay. Um, I mean, if, 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 if other people are putting in 40-hour work weeks and you're putting in 100-hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing, you know that in, in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You, you will achieve in four months. So uh, one of the, I think, most common questions I, I hear young people, ask, ambitious young people ask is, I want to be the next Elon Musk, how do I do that? Um, obviously, the next Elon Musk will work on very different things than, than you did, but what have you done or what did you do when you were younger that uh, you think sort of set you up to have a big impact? Well, I think first of all, I should say that I did not expect to be involved in all these things. So the, 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 the five things that I thought about at the time in, in college, so quite a long time ago, uh, 25 years ago, um, you know, being, you know, making life multi-planetary, um, accelerating, accelerating the transition to sustainable energy, um, the, the internet, broadly speaking, um, and, and then genetics and AI. I think um, I didn't expect to be involved in, 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 in all of those things. I actually, at the time in college, I, I sort of thought um, helping with electrification of, of, of cars was, was how I would start out. And that's, uh, that's actually what I worked on as an intern was um, advanced uh, ultra capacitors with, to see if they, if they would be a breakthrough relative to batteries for energy storage in, in cars. And then when I came out to go to Stanford, um, that's what I was going to be doing my grad studies on is, um, is was working on advanced uh, uh, energy storage uh, technologies for electric cars. And then I put that on hold to start an internet company in, in 95 because um, the, 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 there does seem to be like a time for particular technologies uh, when they're at uh, a steep point in the inflection curve, and um, and I didn't want to, you know, do a PhD at Stanford and then and watch it all happen, um, and then and, and I wasn't entirely certain that the technology I'd be working on would actually succeed. Um, like you can get you can get a you know doctorate on many things that ultimately are not do not have a practical bearing on the world, um, and I wanted to. You know, just I really was just trying to be useful. That's the optimization. It's like, what what, are the, what can I do that would actually be useful? Do you think people that want to be useful today should get PhDs? Um, mostly not. So what, <laughs> yeah. is, what is the best way? Some to be useful? yes, but mostly not. Um, how should someone figure out how they can be most useful? Whatever this thing is that you're trying to create, what would what would be the um, utility delta compared to the current state of the art times how many people it would affect. So that's why I think um, having something that has a, that's, that has a, makes, makes a big difference but affects a 
sort of small to moderate number of people is great, as is something that makes e even a small difference, but it, uh, but affects a vast number of people. Like the area, yeah, under, you know, under the, the, area curve. Under the curve. Yeah, exactly. The uh, under, area under the curve is would actually be roughly similar for those two things. So it's actually really about, um, uh, yeah, just trying to be useful and matter. And then when uh, you're trying to estimate probability of success, so you say this thing will be really useful, good mm -hmm. area under the curve, uh, I guess to use the example of SpaceX. Mm -hmm. When you made the go decision that you were actually going to do that, this was kind of a very crazy thing at the time. Very um, crazy, very for sure. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, people are not shy about saying that. Um, but I kind of agree. I agreed with them that it was quite crazy. It, crazy if, um, if, the, if the objective was um, to achieve the um, best risk-adjusted return, um, starting a rocket company is insane. Um, but that was not that was not my objective. How do you spend your days now? Like, what do, what do you mm -hmm. allocate most of your time? My time is mostly split, uh, well, split between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, and of course I, I try to spend um, uh, a part of every week at OpenAI. Um, so I spend most, I spend basically half a day at OpenAI most weeks, um, and then and then I have some OpenAI stuff that happens during the week. But other than that, it's really and what do SpaceX you do when and you're Tesla. At SpaceX or Tesla. Like, what does your time look like there? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of people think I, I must spend a lot of time with media or, or on businessy things, but actually, almost uh, almost all my time, like 80% of it, is spent on engineering design, I engineering and design. So it's um, developing next generation product. At, that's 80% of it. Um, you probably don't remember this. A very long time ago, many many years, you took me on a tour of SpaceX. And uh, the most impressive thing was that you knew every detail of the rocket and every piece of engineering that went into it. Uh, and I don't think many people get that about you. Yeah, I think a lot of people think I'm kind of a business person or something, which is fine. Like business is fine, but um, like I, uh, but really, it's you know, it's like at SpaceX, uh, Gwen Shotwell is chief operating officer. She kind of manages um, uh, legal, finance, um, sales. Um, and kind of general business activity, and then my time is almost entirely with the uh, engineering team, working on improving our, the, the Falcon 9 and the uh, Dragon spacecraft, and developing the Mars colonial architecture. Um, and then at Tesla, it's working on the Model 3 and the, you know, some in the design studio, typically um, half a day a week, um, dealing with this aesthetics and and. Uh, look and feel things and, and then most of the rest of the week is just going through engineering of, of, of the car itself as well as engineering of the the factory.